Hey everybody, it's CryptoBurb Adrian. Welcome to today's The Nest Show podcast. This is yet another episode of the entire series that we recently managed to bring back after quite a quite a period of a break and silence on the podcast side uh, as the market kind of like continued sideways. And here today we have, have a truly special guest and truly special guest, which is uh, not really something that is that is too obvious because we have a brand new team member to the Burb Nest on today's podcast, right? And we're talking about nobody else but BC Richfield. And we're going to actually go and get a deep dive into his way of thinking in terms of the markets, his way of approaching the markets on the analytical side, the tools, the techniques that he's utilizing on a daily basis and contributing to the Burb Nest community on so many different layers. So that being said, I'm happy to kick it off and welcome BC Richfield to today's show. How are you doing, Paul? How's it going? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you, bud. And thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Amazing. Amazing. And like I said, you know, this is um, this is kind of like, you know, a very um, uncommon situation, right? Because we don't really get many people coming into the nest uh, as the as the contributors, as the team members, especially. So it is not really often or, or frequent uh, that I happen to interview uh, on the podcast, you know, the actual team members of ours. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy and kind of actually curious how it's going to roll. But uh, how about we are going to kick it off with a little bit of your background story? Like why BC Richville? What is this? What does it mean? What is your background story, man? Well, so starting with the the BC Richfield with the name, it's um, it's actually a play on an old Disney <laughs> children's series called Dinosaurs, and he was kind of this big uh, Triceratops business character, you know. And I don't know why it kind of it resonated with me because there was kind of the fun element that brought to the corporate side, and I think trading for me, and especially the kind of cryptocurrency community, has always resembled that kind of crossover between the optimism and the hope and the uh, you know the youth and the fresh eyes that you get on a market like this versus that kind of corporate side that's seen as very financial okay got you got you so i like i'm not sure if this is the same series that we're talking about the same cartoon but i recognize this green dinosaur this gr no this this wasn't triceratops but there was some memes flowing around on the internet with these dinosaurs um, absolutely absolutely kind of right yeah the green one was the dad earl and then you had this baby that used to hit him over the head with a pan i mean <laughs> it all sounds so ridiculous when you say it out loud but i think it's just to kind of show that you know there's a little bit of fun behind you know all of the serious side that you see to trading and that actually you know uh, you, you can kind of balance the two if you want to uh -huh. yeah gotcha gotcha yeah we were we were sort of like i never watched this series to be honest so um I, it's not often it's not frequent for me to actually talk about that i i, I was okay. actually just you know more and more more of a fan of, of tom and jerry or you know johnny <laughs> bravo or or and at Yeti, maybe at times, there are like some crazy, <laughs> crazy cartoons there on the shows they're, they're playing. Uh, you don't get it anymore, right? You don't get no, it anymore right now. No, not, days, the, not only... the same as it. It's not the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You only get these sort of like, you know, super contrast color rich, you know, cartoons, which actually, you know, if if, if it played wrong, you know, can actually cause some sort of like an epilepsy. Jesus, it's, yeah. it's terrible. It's terrible. To the, it's uh, all a bit too thing. sensory, isn't it? A bit too sensory, I think. Yeah, yeah, it does seem so. Uh, yeah, we've briefly, very briefly touched upon trading side because you mentioned, you know, how it actually just combines or, or wraps around trading for the BC Richfield kind of like nickname. But uh, what are the origins? Like, when did you decide to become a trader? How did it look like? So it's quite funny, actually. So I studied uh, business economics at, at university. But in, in truth, my passion was always geared towards business. Um, and I say business in a kind of broad sense. I think... Uh, I was always really drawn to sort of that concept of freedom, being able to control your own destiny, you know, putting your work, uh, your ethics, the way that you live, what you believe in and your passion um, and, and, you know, manifesting that into into a business. And, you know, I, I, I learned a lot at, at university, but I learned a lot more in the real world. I kind of went out, had a couple of businesses straight off the back of university that were, you know, relatively successful. And I actually... Um, was always kind of pushed in school, university, stuff like that to go towards the kind of finance side. And I think because I didn't, I don't know if I was kind of exposed to it in the wrong way or I kind of 
you know, misconstrue the industry. I saw it as very much, you know, banking, very corporate, very constrictive. So I always kind of moved away from that kind of conformist approach, I think, which is what led me into business. But a very good friend of mine um, became a trader about the same sort of time that I was starting starting these businesses up. And the more I spoke to him about it, I, I think the more it kind of interested me because, you know, the more you learn about it, the more kind of... Um, there's so many different ways to approach it, whether you look at the psychological aspects, whether you look at the way that, you know, people will use moving averages or volume or, you know, there's so many different ways to come together with these ideas. I think that it it's such an appeal to someone that's got a curious mind like me, you know. So I think when I started um, and, and obviously, you know, the the crypto boom, if you like, has a lot to do with that, right? Because it brought a lot of people like me into this space that otherwise probably wouldn't have seen it as as so appealing in a lot of ways. So yeah, when I came into it, I was just, I was madly hooked. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in a position where I had, you know, two relatively successful businesses that were both under management and kind of said to myself that if you really want to go for this and you really want to do it properly, you have to put a lot of work into it. You have to put a lot of structure into it. And I actually stepped away from my businesses and spent a couple of years basically just learning absolutely full time, you know, um, and that's never stopped, never stopped for me. Um, I think that curiosity, that passion for learning, there's not many spaces that offer you the opportunities, right? Um, and actually, I found it a very welcoming space from people like yourself and other people that have helped me out along the way. And I think the more you learn, um, it opens up a lot of doors for you, right? And I think that was the kind of real key for me was this idea of financial freedom, controlling my own destiny and having something that I could, you know, build upon. Um, and in truth as well, a, bit, a big passion of mine is teaching, right? You know, I've done mm -hmm. it in several other areas before. Um, and it's nice, you know, a lot of people gave up a lot of time to help me on my journey. And I find it quite nice to kind of, you know, contribute that back on the other side. So I think the balance for me is the passion for learning, the love of trading, and then also the ability of kind of sharing that with other people and, and hopefully helping them on their journey as well. Yeah, this is already such a golden line. We could actually just put a pause in here <laughs> in the podcast for today. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but in all honesty, I thought for a little, for a second, I thought you were go with the full kind of like quote from Warren Buffett because once he <laughs> said that the more you learn, the more you will earn eventually, yeah. right? So uh, yeah, but this is this is actually very true. You know, I'm finding it some some sort of like you know similar. Um, mindset towards the business to want towards the dedication that you put right and effectively and eventually the way I read it you know the money should never be the definite goal right it never should oh, yeah. be this sort of like a destiny it should be if anything it should be some sort of like a driver or or um or means you know to, mm -hmm. to, to realizing some some bigger uh some bigger goals right bigger than oneself uh, which is the reasons why business are created, basically. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't agree agree more with that. And something that anybody that I work with, or you know, anybody that's part of the community that that we're lucky to share, um, I always say to them, you know, you, you can't be focused on on the financial gains and the money. That's that's a byproduct of a successful trading strategy, right? So you have to focus on the strategy and understanding what you're doing intimately. Um, exactly. And, and the money comes off the back of that. Yeah. Yeah. And see how actually fluent that becomes, you know, uh, like regardless of whether, whether you talk about the business as, uh, you know, outside of financial world or uh, the very financial business in terms of trading, you actually apply the very similar set of rules of universal rules and laws, right? Just like we discussed. And, and if you can really dedicate, you know, uh, so much time to learning, you know, uh, and improving your skills, in order, you know, to actually serve some better purpose, some bigger goals, some bigger purpose, uh, then the money just comes as a byproduct, just like you said beautifully. And while we are, while we are, you know, somewhere uh, getting a little bit deeper into the discussion about the markets, about te technical analysis, let's uh, let's actually touch upon the reasons for why technical analysis, right? Because knowing mm. There are there are so many different ways to factor in you know the market changes, fundamental analysis, sentiment approach, you know, on chain behavior as well in terms of cryptocurrencies and whatnot. Why technical analysis? Um, yeah, I mean, really good question. I think for me, it just it appealed straight off the bat. You know, uh, it sounds so naive, but I was so blinkered to any kind of trading when I was introduced to it that when a friend of mine actually took the time to sit down and tell me what candlestick patterns represented support and resistance lines and stuff and I remember thinking like how do these kind of 
magical looking bits and pieces all kind of line up to tell me what money's doing you know it just it didn't make any sense and but the minute you make the link between the psychology behind how this is this kind of represents how people think I think that just kind of blew everything up in my mind you know thinking about the possibilities of learning how people think you know and uh, learning how the masses think, but learning, okay, well, what can I get an edge from? You know, you've still got to be where the smart money is as such, and you still want to understand how everybody's thinking because that's all the nature of the market, right? But but how can you find these edges? And kind of as soon as I started learning, you know, a really, really simple system to start with, it wasn't long, but, you know, I immersed myself in it. It wasn't long before I then started messing about with that and saying, okay, well, what if I throw this moving average in here? Or why don't people use this one, you know? And what if I kind of you know, just try these different things. And I was very, very um, disciplined in who I kind of exposed myself to. I spent a lot of time researching people that I wanted to learn from and researching, you know, the best books, course material, because, you know, the space is very popular, right? And especially bull runs, as no one will know better than you, it's crazy, right? The space just explodes. Um, And there's a lot of noise out there. And you see that noise can be really, really distracting, right? So, I think I was fortunate to have good people around me at the beginning, um, which meant that I could, you know, gather the information I needed to really get a focus on what I wanted to learn. And then I was very, very dedicated to it. So for me, price action was really appealing. I think I kind of saw it almost as like the rawest form of trading, right? Trading almost in its in, in its purest element. You know, we, I've never done a lot of fundamental stuff. I've been exposed to it magnificently since I've joined the nest because we've got some amazing fundamental traders and we always have a great laugh because these guys, you know, their knowledge is, is just insane. And it's, it's just not the world that I, you know, that I come from. Right. So there's Libs and I, you know, on the sidelines, you know, as the simple price action guys, and we're learning so much from these fundamental guys, but I kind of, I understand that a lot better now and how it goes in. But for me, I think that, you know, the charts don't lie, right price actions put on a chart okay you might miss like a big pump or something because of a news event or a big dump but you know for me uh i like to kind of find ways that you can still get in after that so you're not kind of so you know highly tied to that but i think for me it's got a pure kind of form for it i love studying it i love how it kind of evolves um Mm. and and i think there's so much to learn right True, true, true. Uh, before we actually dive, you know, um, one feed or another, you know, a bit into what level to level means actually following your Twitter bio, right? Because mm-hmm. it does somehow regard price action. So before we actually just get a proper understanding of that for the viewers and listeners, uh, I want to ask you if you are actually more on the team, uh, say, you know, there is big chats, my, my good friend, who is also a good technical analyst, you know, and he kind of like... Of course, paraphrasing, I'm not going to quote him on that. But uh, the way the way I see it, you know, he definitely takes price action as, um, I mean, not, not just as a trading technique, but but just the candlesticks, you know, that they actually cover for 100% uh, information available on the market. Mm-hmm. Right? It, this, there is a bastion of traders, uh, which actually you know, just relies on the foundation of technical analysis that argues that 100% of information available it is discounted in the price uh, well, in the price charts, right? Uh, I personally kind of like not necessarily agree with that maybe uh, because of insider trading, because of any other reasons. But do you happen to be on the team that believes 100% of the price in, of the price is actually just, you know, of the story is put in the price or there are some other external factors, there are other uh, reasons for to believe the price doesn't um, efficiently just, you know, discount the price, uh, the information. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. So I definitely don't want to be on the fence (laughs) for this one. But um, for me, I think any news event, any catalyst, anything that can change the market is is always reflected in the charts, right? So if you get a big pump that's caused by a news event, okay, that's fair enough. And I do believe there's catalysts like that that do affect the market because you see reversals and you see continuation where typically you wouldn't on certain assets, right? So I think there's definitely external factors. But for me, I would say I'm very much in the camp where 90% and above, um, I base my trading on 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 price action and, and getting back to that kind of level to level point. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I like breaking charts down exactly as that says level to level. So I'm going from support to resistance. I'm breaking things down into ranges because for me, I think that kind of suits my setup. It suits my eye and psychologically how I see these kind of 
um, how I see the price developing as you go through. But I mean, if I was to have to put myself in one camp or the other, I would definitely be in the camp that says that the price action is, you know, that w- whatever happens to an asset is reflected in its price action on the charts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, this is this is of course, you know, uh, not intended to actually just put you on defense, just like you said. Instead, <laughs> uh, this is a very academic discussion, right? If you think about it, mm-hmm. because there has been, uh, you know, infinite amount of, of 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 courses and discussions on the academic levels, you know, whether or not the market is actually efficient or inefficient in terms of how fast or if at all it absorbs all the available information, right? And uh, arguably, you know, many people, many people would search for certain chart patterns in order to predict pandemics or perhaps predict whenever Elon Musk tweets, right? <laughs> I say it's impossible, right? Uh, regardless of what I do believe, uh, eventually it's how you apply it, uh, how, how you apply this analysis part into your proper trading and how you make money of it rather than just being right or wrong, right? You mm-hmm. can be wrong about the analysis and still make money, right? So... So this is uh, this is just a little bit of, of you know pulling the leg and an academic discussion going on, uh, but uh, you know slowly kind of like getting um, getting into the details on the charts because the next point I wanted to actually cover with you uh, is your 2022 market outlooks in terms of what's been going on so far you know uh, in the traditional finance in the traditional markets uh, outside crypto which is the equities which is commodities uh, yeah. and anything else. Um, truly regarding that, um, as well as the crypto itself, right? So why don't we give a proper look inside the charts uh, with your, uh, well, with your thoughts, with your insights? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, what we've got here to start with is is a Bitcoin chart. So in terms, <clears throat> excuse me, if I go kind of backwards on what you're saying, and I start with crypto and backwards rationalize that That's through, fine. through tra- traditional markets is, um, you know, Bitcoin, is very much affected, as is all cryptocurrency by the traditional markets, right? You know, there's obviously there's this ongoing conversation about the confluence between the two and whether you can use certain traditional assets as kind of, uh, you know, um, counter correlated assets to Bitcoin. And I absolutely think that you can. So, you know, one of the things I'm always watching is is the DXY, right? So like the dollar, the dollar chart, because, you know, you, you will often see strength in that relates very, very frequently to weakness in risk on assets um, such as Bitcoin and and cryptocurrencies. So I think one thing that I always have an eye on, kind of an uh, an eagle eye perspective on, is the traditional markets, okay, equities. I look very closely at the the ES, at the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, um, because they, especially with something like the NASDAQ, having that link to technology stocks, okay, you can often get a little bit of a leading indication from those into what's going on. But in my mind, I'm always trying to break things down initially into, okay, is the market appetite risk on or is it risk off? All right. And then from that point, I'm not holding a bias either way, but what I'm then looking to do is go into the charts and find out, okay, well, how do I, you know, I'm not just going to take that as golden, right? I want to then go into the charts and see what the charts are telling me. Okay. Have we got risk off assets pumping? How strong are they looking? Where are they relative to their support and resistance? And how is that counter correlated to where the risk on assets are, you know? So if we're seeing risk assets, you know, starting to drop, but we've got risk off assets going up and you're going into kind of a key resistance area, then that for me gives a nice kind of inflection point where you're maybe looking and saying, okay, you're bringing in some indications, you're looking for your divergences and you're saying, okay, what are our chances here of getting a reversal? And then I'm looking to trade any assets at the extremities, okay? So at the key points of support and resistance. So we either okay. reject or we reclaim. It's typically where the liquidity sits. So I'm looking for candlestick patterns. I'm using indicators. Obviously, the Berber Case Pro, which I use mainly for its divergences. I use the RSI and I use a stochastic RSI as well, which I'll bring in here. Mm-hmm. And for me... I'm looking for a few key things. When we get into a a key level of support or resistance, so if we take this as an example here, you know, these candle patterns, first of all, are telling us a lot, okay? You know, we've come above here. We've got these wicks to the downside as we've come back into this a second time. We can see the reaction. And then for me, I'm looking for a few key things here. I like to see... The stochastic RSI here, 
above the 70 line, which is what I consider overbought. Traditionally, they're kept on an 80, but I drop it a little bit similar to a traditional RSI. So the 70 and the 30 lines. So I like to see that up in an area where we've been into a, into overbought and we're starting to come back down. And the same here with the RSI. So you're you know, a 70, 30 set, set up. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. 70, 30 okay. on, on, on both. And then on the RSI, I mark out the 50 line as well. So typically if I'm, you know, swing to intraday uh, trading and especially scalping, I tend to kind of section the chart off vertically. So if we take this for an example, as we can see here on the RSI, let me just make that a little bit bigger. What we've got here, we can see where the RSI has dropped below the 50 line. So what I'm saying to myself in that instance is I'm going to put a line in here and mark that red to show that we're in a in a downtrending environment. I'm not looking to trade that on this time frame. I'm using it to kind of segment this off. I then here have the 20 and 50 period moving averages, the 20 green and the 50 in pink. Um, and then I'm looking for two things. I want to be below that ideally, and I want to see if we've got any divergences, which for me, I'm mainly kind of focusing on the one hour. So as we can see here, we've got our divergence, right? We've had our rejection. This has actually taken us back inside the range. As we can see here, we deviated above the range. We've come back in. We haven't quite tested the high. But we've broken below the moving averages here. This red line represents the trend that we're taking off of the four hour. I'm using the one hour mainly to look for divergences before I drop to a 15 minute chart, which is the chart that I trade the most. And then from here, we can see as we come back down, I'm looking for this to then pull back into the moving averages. Okay. I'm taking the fact I'm only interested in taking short trades at this point. Okay, because we're in a bearish trend, which is signified by the four hour. All right. So our kind of high yeah. time frame, as I would consider it. So I'm waiting for that initial dump. And then I'm waiting for the pullback into the moving averages. And I'm looking for what I would call key reversal or continuation candles. So that would be uh, in this instance, it would be a bearish engulfing candle. It would be an inside bar breaking to the downside, or it would be a pin bar candle. OK, so as we come back into this level here, we've had the rejection. We've come back down. We've rejected again. Yeah. So we've set that lower high. As we then come back in again, we've got this bearish engulfing candle. We've got our stochastic RSI bear cross, as I said before, above the 70 line. And we've got an RSI that's still below the 50. OK. So for me, I'm then looking at the moving averages and saying, OK, you know, we've got a downtrending 50 period moving average. This bearish engulfing candle here has closed us below the 20 period moving average. So I can get a really nice tight stop loss in there. Make sure that I've got a really good risk to reward. And then target one would be that support resistance line there. And target two would be this down here. All right, which would be represented by the kind of range low or the channel bottom. And then what I would do from there to manage the trade out, I would drop it onto like a five minute chart using the same moving averages. And then I'm waiting for those, for price action to break those moving averages, close above them in a bullish trend. And then I'm looking to de-risk the trade quite heavily or, or close most of it out at that point. So we are, we are just stepping down in a scale, step up, step up, step by step. <laughs> we're inevitably <laughs> going into one second charts in a moment, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we're not, not that bad yet. Occasionally the one minute chart, you know, if okay. you're feeling it. <laughs> good, good, good. Amazing. Please continue. Perfect. So that's just to kind of give an idea how I kind of view, how I view the charts. Okay, so I'm looking to do that. In terms of how I'm getting my levels, I'm taking them off of the higher time frame first, especially if you're talking with traditional market assets, then I'll look on the kind of 12 month, drop that onto the quarterly and then, you know, take the quarterly down onto the monthly, monthly to the weekly um, to get my key levels. But then if I'm trading a specific area, I'm typically looking to kind of break something down into ranges so that I get the most relevant information. So if we were to consider this the range higher, at this point, consider this the range low. 
and we can see here we've got our our midline okay so mm -hmm. for me i'm looking to trade up here or i'm looking to trade here and as we can see as we kind of come into this point here we've got our initial rejection we've come back we've taken the liquidity we've mm -hmm. had you know a bearish candle closing us back within this range we're then waiting for the rsi to get back under that 50 line and then we're looking to trade it okay so okay. in terms of in terms of how that would play out in crypto the only difference really to getting those levels or breaking any of these levels into ranges is that there's typically less data to use in uh, on most crypto assets right so i'll typically start with the monthly and then decant that down to the uh, to the weekly and then on to the daily but okay. <clears throat> something that i that i use a lot um and that i speak uh to people a lot about is is the dxy chart mm -hmm. now for me this has been really important in terms of trying to gauge the the risk on and risk off sentiment within the market and from here you know you can make some really really key decisions so again this is just it's just been split into a simple range um this represents a long-term support and resistance level so when we're coming down here and when we're at these key points inflection points if you like then i'm very much watching what crypto is doing when we're here at support and you know even more so when we're up in these regions here at resistance okay and as we start to get those rejections or we start to get those pumps I'm then looking at, okay, how's that affecting the risk on assets of which obviously Bitcoin cryptocurrency is, uh, is as, almost as risk on as you can get. And I think it gives you a really good leading indication um, of the appetite of the market towards kind of risk or risk off. Um, and obviously you just need to be careful with cryptocurrency. You know, it's incredibly volatile. It can go up very quickly and it can come down even quicker than it went up. So any little edge that we can get to look at these and say, okay, well, how does this affect our bias? I want my high time frame bias, which for me, being more of a low time frame trader, when I'm saying high time frame, I'm looking at the four hour and kind of the highest really is, is the daily. Um, and then if we look at, for example, how this would affect something like the NASDAQ mini futures, which actually we have a, a recent trade we did up here with the group. But it's the same thing, right? We can see the ranges and, you know, some people will say, okay, we dropped right out of the range here. I'm actually looking for these, okay? So, you know, whether you call these fake outs or deviations, liquidity grabs, whatever, you know, I like these. These give a lot of confluence in terms of if you're looking to get and break out of the range, you want to be seeing strength here, right? If you're seeing weakness, and again, you know, it, it sounds quite simple when you say it, and I suppose I am really a fairly simple creature especially when it comes to trading but you know we've got our bearish engulfing candle there we've got a rejection from a key level we've got confluence here from the stochastic rsi that's crossing and starting to come back down and an rsi that's falling uh from overbought now i'm not saying you would just blindly enter at that point right but within that within those three key bits of information you can you can gather a lot okay and then I don't like the idea of information paralysis. I want to keep things really nice and clean. So I'm looking for my divergences with the B Pro. And then it all adds into the confluence that you can get. And, and for me, it's all about telling a story. And I'm saying to myself, okay, where's this story taking me? If I'm more bearish than I am bullish, why? What have I got? You know, so the story I'm putting together is saying, okay, I've got confluence here from the fact that we've had a rejection and an underside retest of a key level. We've got bearish divergence on the B Pro. We come under here, you know, we're losing the moving averages, which we wouldn't be trading on this level. We would take that down on the 15 minute, in which case we'd be under the moving averages at this point. We take the retest and then we trade the asset to the downside. So for me, it's a very versatile system because I employ the same system across all different assets, whether they're traditional markets, Forex or cryptocurrency. Um, and they can also be done across different timeframes. You know, I favor using the four hour to give me the bias for the trend. And then I like to execute on the 15 minute, occasionally the five minute. Um, but I'll typically on traditional assets make that the one day in terms of gathering the trend and executing more on the kind of four hour and one hour. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, this is actually, you know, uh, well, a proper deep dive. I can tell that 
you know, aside aside from the uh, aside from the price action alone, which some people would refer to it as as a naked chart, uh, you also incorporate two set um, a set of two moving averages. What are they? What are, what are the periods? That's it. So the green one is the twenty period moving average, and the pink one okay. is fifty. Pink one is fifty. You said. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And those are like the, the simple moving averages or EMAs. No, that's it. Yes. Yeah. So they're exactly right. So SMAs, um, and I, I use them for two reasons, really. One is the crosses, especially down on sort of the 15 minute chart. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the bullish bearish crosses, but also in terms of, of, of the trend, you know, when we're looking at kind of when we get across like this, how the moving averages move, do they start to move up quite aggressively? Are we starting to see space mm -hmm. between the two? Because when you get into areas of chop, like you get down here so much, you see the moving averages stay a little bit closer together. You can then get your confluence that you've got here from, mm -hmm. say, your stochastic RSI that's stuttering a bit, same as the RSI. So I'm using it really as kind of a little bit of a guide on trend or if we're maybe starting to lose mm -hmm. a little bit, but also for execution on the lower time frames because I'm looking for these pullbacks mm -hmm. into the moving averages. If we hold them and then we have a bullish reaction, in this case, say, for example, a bullish engulfing candle, pin bar, or an inside bar breakout, which we would have here, for example, then again, it's offering me really good R to R, right? I'm getting a good return for my risk. I'm at a key level here of support. I've got to pull back into this. I've got my high time frame bias, and that's where I'm looking to execute. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So the, for for clarification to everybody listening here to the podcast, you know, I asked purposely, purposely on the on the uh well using whether it would be you know uh, smas or emas or any other form of moving averages because frankly speaking there are hundreds if not thousands you know of different variants and different options that mm -hmm. you can choose from right there are some triangular averages there are volume weighted averages there are some linearly weighted averages that you can basically just put a put in a row and an assign set and line your weights to each and, and every single value price. Uh, and truly speaking, you know, what's, what's also, what always striking me, what is always striking to me is that uh, you can kind of like, you know, go and, and actually just try to implement thousands of different indicators. <laughs> and eventually you would always come back to these good old, good old you know, moving averages, one, one day <laughs> or another, right? There is, certain, there is some magic to it. And uh, I initially thought, you know, I remember of my early days, I initially thought, okay, I mean, moving averages are simple, right? They are too simple. There, there mm -hmm. must be some catch to it. Uh, there must be something wrong with it, right? It mm -hmm. cannot be this simple. And, uh, and of course, after making a few round circles, you know, 360 kind of like moves, <laughs> uh, like studying for different tens of hundreds of books and, and actual courses, you know, I ended up being in exactly the same place where I came from, realizing that moving averages are somewhat uh, the most practical tools. Yeah. And uh, this is this is just funny, just a short anecdote. But speaking of uh, speaking of those of those different layouts, you know, for crypto, for equities, for commodities, uh, for for dollar, you know, because this definitely is all intercorrelated, right? There is mm -hmm. some different correlation to it. Uh, and also a fun note to everybody listening to the podcast, you know, it had not always been this way, to be honest, only as the mm. computerization of, of the markets, as the computers kind of went viral, you know, in the, uh, well, in the late 20th century, only then actually, you know, the markets had become, you know, very much more correlated than it, than it used to be. And uh, because the information available on the market um, you know, was basically available to many people at the same time, right? There was no, um, there were there were no kind of like barriers as well to the free market, especially you know after the you know the kind of like Soviet regimes also kind of like went, uh, you know, went down, which were kind of like you know stopping the free market in allowance. And mm -hmm. uh, this is this is very interesting to watch that as much as we incorporate computers in the analysis, you know, and, and having this this 24-7, 365 data kind of like inflow, this popularizes overall use of technical analysis and the way that the markets are correlated. And it strengthens this correlation. It is very, very important and very, I think, interesting and intriguing to keep watching and monitoring for this. So highly recommend it for everybody who's listening to go and have a read and here and there about uh, about correlation, about 
how mm-hmm. technical an- analysis incorporates the correlation. It's a very interesting topic. And a uh, question to you, BC Richfield, then, uh, is, this any, is there any, uh, any specific kind of like a trading uh, setup, trading pattern that you're looking at in terms of like having a favorite trade idea? Is there any specific uh, chart or pattern, let's say, that you choose uh, to see uh, or trade on in Bitcoin or, or, or the you know, Nasdaq minis? Uh, mini futures, or be it anything else, be it you don't try, you don't trade triangles, you trade only rectangles. Like, how does it look? Yeah, so I mean, um, I, I typically apply the all what I would call traditional or quite simple traditional forms of support and resistance. So I will use trend lines. Um, I like patterns more so, such as uh, rising channels, rising wedges. Um, bits and pieces like that, because for me, <clears throat> I, I do like to keep things simple, right? I like to stick to a to a system that I understand intimately. And for me, the triggers come from ideally deviations, um, you know, or fake outs, uh, as people would call them. So when we have, as we have here, which I'll just show you very quickly, just to give people an idea. So my go-to are your kind of horizontal support and resistance lines, okay? And then I'm looking for price getting into that point, ideally deviating or rejecting from that level or reclaiming that level. And from there, as we can see here, if you apply the same methodology to a rising channel, where we're looking to get our trades, as I said before, are at the extremities, okay? So whenever price interacts with these key levels, that's where we're looking to trade, all right? And up here, and also as well, especially on the higher time frame charts, then the midline here of any channel. So for me, what I'm saying to myself all the time as price is coming into a key level is what confluence do we have that this move is either exhausted here and it's looking to reverse, or have we got the strength to get above here and kick on? Um, and going back to like we were talking about with traditional markets, I'll check the DXY, see if there's any key points going on there. If it's kind of fairly neutral, then I don't make too much of an allowance for it because we can run either way. But if it's at a key support or resistance level, that's a massive thing to factor in. But I'm always looking whether you're using a rising channel, whether you're using a rising wedge, falling wedge. It's the key support and resistance levels for me and how we interact with them when we go in. So if we just take this one as, as an example here, we can see that as we've come into this level, we come back down to here. Again, we've got a stochastic RSI that's uh, that's trading in overbought, well above the 70 line. Okay, we can already see that that's downtrending here. Okay, before we've even made this initial drop. We've then got an RSI here that's given us a beautiful lower high. B Pro would have triggered us off a divergence at this point as well, which is obviously significant, especially on the four hour chart. So from here, we're saying, okay, what are we looking for? Well, we've come up, we've had our rejection here. We've had our retest, okay, at the top side of the channel or the range higher. And then from there, we're dropping that down again onto our lower time frames, and we're looking to execute, knowing that if I'm wrong, then I know exactly where I am wrong, okay? Because my theory is incorrect if we break and hold above here, in which case then you cancel the trade. But... One of the things I like about this system is often when, if you are incorrect in that and it does find this strength from somewhere or there is a catalyst like we were talking about earlier that might happen outside um, of price action, like you said, uh, I actually agree with you. I don't really think you can price in for pandemics um, or major events like that. I think the, the charts will reflect what is happening and what has happened, but I don't think that they magically predict what's going to happen down the line. So you're saying, okay, well, if I'm wrong here, We've deviated once, we've deviated here a second time. If we now come above here, hold this level and then break out, well then, you know, I'm super confident above here that we're going to the upside, okay? And again, even taking that trade, where am I wrong? Okay, I'm wrong down here. So I'm playing to a big upside potential, but a small downside. Okay, so again, that kind of, you know, our risk to reward mm. is, is a key factor in anything that I'm looking at. Okay, okay, I got you. This, this, is, this is clean, definitely. And I think it also, uh, well, relies on this, on this actual 
Now, practice of premise, you know, that many people would find uh, real in trading crypto or any other markets, frankly speaking. And we're talking about this, this tendency for the failed patterns to return better, uh, well, better, re better, better rewards or better mm -hmm. returns uh, overall than, than the actual patterns, right? So mm -hmm. let's say if we have now, uh, if we have a head and shoulders, you know, pattern or inverted inverse head and shoulders, whatever, uh, you know, and if it actually just breaks, you know, above or below its, you know, neckline, so if you will, right, and then that it doesn't really manage to sustain this breakout and it fails to hold and maintain certain level, then it tends to fail, right? Present itself as a swing failure, mm -hmm. and uh, and more often than not, these swing failures, the failed patterns. Uh, those liquidity graphs tend to revert mm -hmm. the markets in a more aggressive manner as the sell-off kind of like continues if it's for an upwards reversal pattern that fails. Absolutely. And uh, this is this is definitely very interesting because many people would uh, would think, you know, that, well, would expect that head and shoulders, let's say, breakout, uh, the inverse head and shoulders breakout, you know, through its neckline to the upside, it actually is going to return this this marvelous measured move <laughs> uh while more often than not if it's such a pattern that fails uh to you know for its breakout to be maintained then it actually returns even better uh even better profits in the opposite direction that that's a just a side note interestingly yeah. uh, do we have do we have any any sort of like a best looking chart a best looking setup that you're eyeing right now well actually this this lunar chart is is one of them right because Again, just very quickly, if I we're talking about sort of trading channels, looking for support and resistance, I think something I would encourage people to look at is getting kind of confluence for these levels, right? And kind of building a picture as to why we, we think that there might be a reversal here or, or why we're kind of putting our eggs into the bias basket that we have, right? So, for example, with this, if I just kind of get rid of this chart very quickly, the, the channel, sorry, what we can see is, you know, the key points that we've got here. You know, and we can see how, even if we just take these first two as an example, and I know it's kind of semantics because it would have been involved in where the channel was started, but if we just look at those and we take those away, now there's our deviation from the channel, there's our deviation from the channel. They're also our horizontal support and resistance lines, all right? So very often these kind of areas, when you have that kind of confluence, can just give a little bit more weight to your to your theory. So... With that in mind, <clears throat> the reason that Luna's kind of caught my eye, really, and in, in all truth, I'm, you know, I don't hold a bias beyond what I'm, what the charts are telling me. Okay, so I don't hold particularly long-term biases on anything. I like certain cryptocurrencies, and I like Bitcoin because of what it represents. But I'm there to trade the price action of of that asset. Okay, so I don't try and think about it much beyond that. I just want to know what the charts are telling me, and here. What I like about Luna is we've obviously had this big sell-off to here. Now, if we look at this point here, we've got this dotted line here, which is a key local level, support and resistance. We can see that from here. It's exact resistance, failed to hold this, deviated above, retest, sell-off, come back again, resistance, resistance. Well, we've dropped through this here and we've retested it on the underside. Fine. So... The key thing here, and and as you touched upon really well there, Burb, is that these you know these failures can often lead to much more aggressive moves than if the patterns are successful. So we've dropped out of this level now, and people are feeling very bearish. You know, there's a lot of bearish sentiment out there. Um, the markets are a little bit mixed at the moment, but the risk off appetite is still obviously quite strong. So what I like about that is kind of trying to read between the lines and saying, okay, well, if I can turn this channel back on and say okay well we've got a little bit of extra confluence here as well because we've got the bottom of the channel here or the bottom of our kind of rising channel along with this support resistance line that's acting as resistance so for me it seems like we're going to do one of two things here right we're either going to come down confirm this and then you know we continue dropping in which case i'm looking to see how we react down here which is our 78.6 level but what I'm really looking for is as we start to drop or as we have started to drop here are going to be the people that have already shorted or have shorted this quite quickly. Um, because if this reverses and we get back inside this range, I think there's every chance I would target the mid range first for sure. And then I'd be looking to trade this to the top of the range as well. But as we kind of take out, you've got these stops here, right? 
So lots of shorts opening here, stop losses here or certainly up here. As we trigger that, that's what often gives you that explosive fuel, you know, for these big moves and these big reversal moves. And that's what I want to catch. And if I'm wrong, again, I'm not wanting to sound like a broken record, but if, if I'm not, <laughs> if I'm not correct, then I know where I'm wrong. And I know I've then got this area here to trade. True. Okay. And then I can wait from there to see what our reaction is as we get down there. And maybe we dip down into this and we reverse. But at the moment, I've got my eye on this one for Luna, see how the markets kind of respond over the weekend. And then on Monday, with traditional markets opening again, if we get back inside this range, then I'll be looking for confluence. As I explained, I'm looking for divergences, okay, which we use the B Pro. I'm looking for the stochastic RSI for the cross below the 30 line and trending up, which we've got. And I'm looking for the RSI to kind of have a positive reaction back from, from being oversold. Mm. All right. So at the moment, we've got those on the four hour and I'm saying, OK, we see how that plays out. If We get back inside this range. I'm feeling, you know, short to medium term bullish. If we reject here and we start breaking below these lows, then I feel like I've got a really good chance to kind of scalp this down to our next key support level. Nice, nice, nice. It does seem to be in a quite a decision arbitrary point. So well, well done on presenting that for sure. Um, and let's let's actually you know having covered having covered so much in the charts let's uh, let's actually turn the back charts off for a second uh, because I wanted to quickly touch upon well one of our last topics for for today's Nestro podcast uh, which is basically your uh, well your new role in the verb nest right because mm. not many people um, not many people you know just probably realize that but uh, it is. It is very, very big achievement, I think, for for you and for everybody who also got in uh, in the team with the recent applications, kind of like open for the three months. Uh, just just for a little bit of curiosity for for everybody to spill some beans. Among I, I think two three hundreds of total kind of like uh, applications that we took into consideration, only three. Uh, or four, it's pending, you know, three or four people effectively got in, right? So we're talking about uh, about a hundred, uh, about one in a hundred chance uh, or getting in into the team. And it doesn't only require uh, knowledge, it doesn't only require, you know, this 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 patience and dedication. It also needs good humanity uh, and, and good reasoning, you know, on the, on the proactivity side, which is something that I definitely favor among my other on my team members so uh that being said i want to congratulate to you on joining the team officially thank and, you thank you uh this is this is very amazing what are your growth plans for 2022 with the months ahead just just massive i mean for me it was um it is a massive moment for me because <clears throat> i think uh, trading appeals to a lot of people as it did appeal to me for this kind of not just financial independence but the fact that you're kind of controlling your your own destiny a lot so when the opportunity came up to do this, it wasn't something I'd necessarily really considered before. I think uh, trading and traders in general are fairly solitary animals. You know, we like to be in control of our own destiny. We, we have our own ambitions and our own goals. And that's something that's actually quite difficult to share with, with other people, you know, especially with trading. We all see the charts very differently. We all have our different biases, be it price action fundamentals. And uh, I think the biggest lure for me was just the, the community side and the traders. So yourself, a few of the other traders in the group as well were, were people that I was well aware of going into it, um, which is which is why, you know, when it kind of came up, I, I, you kind of had to pay attention to it, right? And I think we've all got this, this part of us that loves a challenge as well, right? And you're thinking, you know, you don't very often get the opportunity to put yourself shoulder to shoulder with exceptional people within your industry or any industry and kind of, you know, and see how you perform against it, but also see how you like it, right? You, you don't know until you do these things. And for me, it was something that just delivered on so many levels. Um, like I said, I've always been someone that has a big passion for learning. Um, I've always been someone that, that enjoys, you know, anything that I know well enough that I believe I can help someone with, I'm happy to, to teach, right? You know, to the levels of my ability, right? I don't want to step outside my box or my levels, but... As I said, over the years, I've had a lot of very good people help me that's that's played into the success that I've had as a trader. And, and you want to pay that back. I think it's it's nice to kind of you reap what you sow. Um, 
and I, I just think that anybody that isn't kind of hasn't been exposed to, to the bird nest or the bird nest community, I just think it's something they should really do. I think to be around so many like-minded traders and not just the, the professional team, the community there, the education focus, the hunger that people have for learning, you know, a lot of communities you can go into, people want calls, people want to know where to put their money. As we always tell people, you're never, ever going to grow as a trader in that respect. It's fine to have that and use it as part of an overall plan to get better, but you want to really develop your own skills. So you're the one looking at the charts, you're spotting these opportunities, you know where to enter, you know where to exit, and you've got that hunger. And and that's, that's what I love. Um, but actually, aside from that, I love my... Um, you know, teammates, my 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 colleagues, my friends, right? The, the, the other analysts at the group. You know, I even love the fundamental guys. I thought they were all nuts before this, right? Like, why did you Why did you say even? Even, <laughs> I mean, God, I, even like, like fundamentals. Come on, <laughs> you know, being a simple price action trader, I always used to look at fundamentals like it was a little bit, you know, pot and cauldron, and you know, maybe it works well in bull markets, maybe not so much in in bear markets. You know, which is where I learned a lot of my trading, but it's given me such a new found respect for what they do and kind of how they see these opportunities and the work that goes into it. And I think what we're trying to do um, as, a, as, as a company, as like a collective vision is bring the best part of all of these side of trading together and find the way that they work in harmony and find where their synergies are, right? And, and how you can learn so much from others and the couple of the fundamental guys we have our team call weekly with the technical team, which incorporates the fundamental side. We're looking at different assets. How does this fundamental news play into the price action? We, you know, we're all independent traders. We all have our visions. We all have our strategies that we're very loyal to, you know, and as a trader, you know, a big takeaway I'd say to anyone is that you've got to master what you do. You've got to focus on the strategy you want. Don't get distracted. You know, master the elements of what you've got and always continue to learn, right? But make sure that you're staying true to a system. You're applying good risk management. Um, so the reason I say that there is because there's always a risk when you get a group of people together, I think, that you get, you know, too many opinions or, you know, it can skew other people's opinions. And I think what's so exceptional about this group of people that I'm fortunate enough to work with is that we all respect one another more than enough that we're not trying to influence each other nor I, I think could we but what we're trying to do is kind of decode a lot of noise that's out there and use that to provide ourselves with the best information that we can that we can take away plug into our own systems and then share our trades with people and have those questions come back why are your thoughts this way you know why do you think we're going to pump out of this when we've been in a big bearish downtrend what are the what's the catalyst for that what are the triggers and I think that a group of people together with, with that kind of shared vision can come at it from a lot of different angles. And I think it's so exciting. You know, it's uh, a young, not that I think age has got anything to do with it, but it is, it's a young, hungry group of people that not only want to improve themselves all the time, they want to help other people improve. Um, and for stuff like that, I think the sky is the limit. Um, and I, I, that's given me a lot, right? It's, it's given me a lot. It inspires me every day that I get up and I want to go out trading with these guys. And I look forward to speaking to them and seeing how they're developing, how the community is developing. And I think when you've got something like that, it, without wanting to sound too cliche, it does kind of feel a bit like a family, right? And, you know, you, you fight really hard for one another and you learn really hard for one another. And I don't think I've ever been part of a team before where, you know, everybody's scrambling to help everyone else out. You know, it, it just, we all want this collective good. And off the back of that, you know, as we've always said, your success, I think, is a, it is a byproduct of what you're putting in, right? And I think we're putting in a lot. Um, and there's a lot of talent in there, a lot of really exceptional talent. And it's just, it really is a pleasure to work with everyone every day. Well, that must be, that must be the, uh, one of the best, you know, touches here upon the the company's uh, vision mission on on the bird nest. So I definitely share that. And um, you know, there are many reasons for for you to be on board. And I'm super happy to have you on. Man, so congratulations, big time again. And Thank you, uh, well, you've also you've also touched uh, upon the final takeaway. But if you were to rephrase it, paraphrase it, perhaps a little bit again as the final takeaway, there's one kind of like tip, golden takeaway that it can leave all of our listeners and viewers with. Yeah. So for me, I would say, look, be honest with yourself, first of all, about how much time you can bring to trading. It's a massive passion for everyone. OK, but 
you know, most people have full time jobs, families to support, to support, right? So it's all well and good seeing your favorite trader or somebody that inspires you, right? But if they're putting forward a scalping system that means you're sitting behind a, a screen for 10, 12, 14 hours a day, right? Scalping low time frame charts, then th that's probably not for you. And I think the problem is if you're kind of committing yourself to a system that isn't suited to your, you know, resources, if you want your personal resources, your time and your effort that you can put into it, then you're kind of setting yourself up to fail from the off. So I think making sure that you're honest with yourself about the time you can bring to it and the resource and then finding and developing a system around what time and resource you can bring to it and making sure you understand that system intimately. OK, so I see a lot of people getting distracted by one day they're looking at strategies around moving averages. Then the next day, something else is flavor of the month. And then they're bringing in divergences and then it's different indicators. And like we said earlier, you know, I love, love, love testing new ideas and new things. But I have the side of me that's the researcher and the tester. And I have the side of me that's the trader. And when I'm trading, I'm in execution mode. I'm executing something that I know intimately. It helps me commit to trades, help me, helps me not leave them too early because I know the system's tried and tested over time. Yes, I'm always looking to improve, but I have to, have to, have to make sure that first of all, I'm a successful and profitable trader because that's my livelihood. And I think for anybody that's looking to take that step, I think it's a really important step to take. Find something that speaks to you, something that suits your lifestyle and the way that you can trade and the time you can bring to trading. And then focus every ounce of yourself in your spare time to learning everything that you can about that. And joining in just an amazing community like we've got here is one of the best ways to do it because there's always people accessible that you can ask, people that have been there, people that have done it, and that can only help you kind of develop. But I think if I was to say one thing to people, it's find that strategy, back test it, make sure it works for you, and then stick to it along with good risk management because that will be the thing that will really define your future if you are looking for financial freedom. Wow. You know, uh, this is this has been an amazing wrap up, I think. And uh, just just a fun fact, side note, uh, once I spoke to QBS, another member of our team, uh, who's an amazing, talented person for graphic designs and whatnot, super talented guy. Uh, and he said to me, you know, this BC Richfield guy, the moment you enter the team, had a, this BC Richfield guy has a, has a, has a radio voice, has a deep, good radio <laughs> voice. And uh, I can only, you know, I can only commit to, to agreement here. And uh, with all that being said, uh, you know, I definitely, it definitely sounds that with your skills, with your amazing mindset and with your voice as well <laughs> inside, we're going to make it, uh, well, somewhat of a regular you know, a uh, regular rendition of, of, of podcasts and, and episodes. Uh, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. So, man. Thank ladies. you. And just quickly, you've got to give a good yes. shout out to QBS because he did this logo, right? Another bird nest guy. What an absolute talent. So it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I can, I can fully agree. And uh, just like I started, you know, uh, off by saying that, you know, we have a special guest. I think everybody who's been, who's been listening to today's uh, initial episode um, for, for the podcast, you know, can truly confirm that BC Richfield is truly a magnificent uh, trader in person and definitely worth a follow. So for everybody who's actually not following BC Richfield on Twitter, make sure we go straight away and go search for handle at BC underscore Richfield, at BC underscore Richfield. Make sure go ahead and push this follow button, press it on, um, and it's definitely going to be worth it. And that being said, uh, with all this knowledge, with all this wealth and generosity of time uh, from BC Richfield, I want to thank uh, thank you, BC Richfield, for coming over to today's show and thank everybody for listening and tuning in for today's podcast. Great job. Thanks so much. Thank you, my friend. It really has been a joy to be on here and I look forward to hopefully more of them in the future and seeing some of you guys in and around the nest. Amazing. Let it be. Let it be. Everybody, that's all for today. See you on the next shows. God bless you all. Stay safe. Bye-bye.